Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Jennifer Quintana. I'm the Executive Director of Development for FIU Business. Thank you for joining us for today's Word I'm Wednesday. Uh, we have our special guest, Ricky Lavinia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, very excited to, to have you. Um, want to say a quick thank you to our uh, benefactor, Herbert Wertheim, for starting this lecture series many years ago um, to, to really bring speakers like this to campus. And uh, over the last year and a half or so, it's been more about having these virtually. Um, so we're glad for uh, you know the opportunity to bring in an expanded group of folks because we've been able to cast a little bit of a wider net, although Ricky's in our backyard. So hopefully the next time we do this, we'll be able to, to do it live. Um, just some features for the webinar for today. Um, I'm going to kind of go through and ask Ricky some of the questions that we put together for him. And then in the audience, as you have questions, please go ahead and use the, the Q&A feature. Um, you can type in your questions. And uh, in the last 15 minutes or so of our conversation, I will uh, address them to, to Ricky. So. Again, welcome, we'll get right to it. <laughs> um, I have your bio, but I'm not gonna read it. I am gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about you and your background. Um, you know, for the audience, you guys obviously know, uh, you're here to, to hear him speak, but he is the CEO and founder of PaxBio, which has changed the accounting industry quite a bit. But I wanna hear from you, Ricky, just a little bit about your background, how you got here, and We'll take it from there. Sure, not a problem. Um, thanks for having me, Jennifer. So um, I'm an FIU grad. I went to <laughs> uh, grad school there. Um, undergrad was done at, at University of Miami. And um, I started off um, my professional career working at local accounting firms, regional and local accounting firms, uh, doing your, your, your standard audit and, and, and tax work, bounced between both departments. Um, and uh, eventually ended up at PwC. So, uh, you know, what, what everyone in the accounting you know, industry wants, you know, work for a big four. Um, so hopefully I could today provide some perspective about, you know, <laughs> other career paths and, and you know, give some food for, for thought as you guys start contemplating about, you know, what you want to do with your, with your career and, 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 and what you want to do professionally. Uh, but uh, PwC was, uh, was fantastic. I, I want to be here. Um, as a as a startup founder, if it, if it wasn't for my experience there, uh, you definitely work a lot. Um, uh, worked on the audit side here in Miami, um, as I mentioned, was born and raised. So working on you know the cruise lines, uh, you hear a lot of people do. Um, and, and writer was my brow uh, for about five years. So definitely got my my feet wet, um, you know, in the audit space. Eventually before I left, I was managing teams from Singapore to Manchester, helping out M&A deals and things like that, um, which is exciting. Uh, but but hit this uh, kind of fork in the road um, where uh, I, I don't think that they have this policy anymore, but back then in order to make partner, you had to move uh, to New Jersey on the, to, to consult on national issues. So that's where their national audit practice is. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, about you know, if I'm, yeah, well, if, if I'm going to move to New Jersey and some people just pick up and go, that's fine. You know, but my wife and I, we, we love our family down here. Uh, they're our anchor. Uh, you know, I'll get to you know, a little bit later in my story as to how, you know, we were faced with the same decision to move out to Palo Alto um, after the tech company got some traction and why we stayed here. Wow. But this was my first kind of uh, a point and, um, Basically, uh, you know, decided, okay, well, if I'm going to move up to New Jersey, it has to be for a good reason. And, and all throughout the years, it just had a list of things that I felt I could approve uh, in the accounting industry. Um, I felt that that staff were, comp were, were totally underpaid. Okay. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, a professional service firm is, is that a professional service firm. So if you're the professional and you're providing the, the, the product, right. Um, well, uh, I, I felt that you should be compensated proportionally to the size of that product, depending on how, how much the, the, the client is paying. So that was my inception for the idea of tax file, which is um, like Uber for taxes. So our CPAs on the platform, we have about 3,200 of them. 
uh, service not just individuals, but a lot of big firms outsource work to us, okay? Or we call it onshoring, mm -hmm. flex staffing. Um, and you know exactly how much you'll make on a project before you pick it up. So if you have a set goal in mind where you want, want to make, you know, 50K or 120,000 or whatever it is in a year, um, you know, you could schedule your, your, your earnings and, and, and your deliverables around that f with complete control of your, of, of your work-life balance. Okay. And that was, that was, that was my, um, my idea. Um, obviously fast forward six years later, um, you know, we've grown the, the community quite a bit. Uh, we, we're now in 14 countries and, um, and that's a little bit about the thesis. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I love that we're having this conversation. Most of the, the audience today is going to be students. And of course, this is, uh, it's going to be recorded. So other students will also have the opportunity to watch it. Um, we have a big school of accounting. And as you alluded to a little bit earlier, you know, a lot of our students are really just dead set on working for the big four. <laughs> um, and I know that you mentioned, you know, if it wasn't for, for them, you wouldn't really be where you are. Maybe the idea wouldn't have been born, but, um, you know, maybe share a little bit about your thought process, you know, there and, and as a student, what you kind of wish you knew then um, and things to take into account, you know, as a student currently studying accounting with such a broad range of opportunities available. Yeah, you know, heading to right out of college into audit or tax department, whether it's a big four or, you know, a large regional is uh, definitely the path of least resistance, right? In terms of the unknown. So, you know, exactly how the interview process is going to be. They're all on campus. You could get a sense of salary. You could yeah. ask people their experience at that firm, right? Yeah. Um, but that process is, is kind of at the ground floor in the weeds, I think, right? If you if you're to take a step back and, and, and look at the forest, right, and, and truly value the experience that you're getting um, from you know FIU, and then try to parlay that into well, what is my optimal career path? Okay, there's a lot out there that's that's not um, you know set set up so nicely you know in terms of transitioning from FIU to 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 one of these firms that that may be. Uh, better, right? Yeah, it, it takes some some work on your end, right? Because the tools just aren't, aren't kind of there, right? At a career fair or something, right? But now that I have the perspective of working, you know, here essentially with my Silicon Valley, you know, CEO friends and and institutional investors, you know, and I'm more than six years into it, I have a good perspective of, of this world. And I have a good perspective of obviously the accounting world that, you know, at the, you know, at the peak, you know, at PwC. So, um, and then me as a CEO building on different departments here, uh, you know, we're up to 40 employees. We're going to be at 80 at the end of the year. We have an accounting department, I have a CFO, I have a controller, right? Uh, all the standard career paths for an accountant, but I also have like customer success. I have sales, right? And I know what it takes on the inside to, to, to get qualified for one of those jobs, right? So the advantage that you have coming out of college is that you're starting at the ground floor, regardless if you go to a big four um, or take a off the beam path, you know, um, career. Um, so I feel that since you're starting, you know, essentially almost at the same level, if not, maybe once a slight step above, right. That, that you got to look at the forest and, 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 and take into consideration what's best for you. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be in tax your entire life? That's fine. That's great. I mean, we're, we're signing up thousands of CPAs onto our platform that just want to do tax work. That's fantastic. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you kind of feel forced into it or, or you're just joining audit because that's a cop out because it's like, okay, well, that's the most personable, you know, of, of the departments and maybe I could get into advisory, right? You're still at a firm. You're still going to be on that staff, manager, director, partner path, right? And that's not for everyone. You know, uh, we offer our employees stock. Uh, they get paid really well. Uh, we offer internships and a lot of other startups, tech companies, um, you know, younger are, are younger, more agile, do the same. So, um, you know, you, it's, it's not, it's not binary. It's not, I have a, a, a you know, a concentration in accounting and therefore I have to be an accountant, right? You mm -hmm. could get into, you know, customer, customer success at, you know, let's say you want to work for, you know, a Stripe or Twilio or, or, or Google, right? Um, th th those are options, you know, with, with the degree that, that, that you have today, 
and and you'll be on a completely different kind of like like career path than than the traditional yeah yeah i love the the hybrid between startup tech company and accounting and and the intersection there is, is really interesting so i want to go back to a comment that you made why did you move to new jersey or palo alto actually so um why did i move to, to palo mm -hmm. yeah okay so yeah, yeah. um when, when, yeah when i started the company we uh we we started raising some money obviously as any startup and uh we were getting uh when we launched for the best new app on the app store and that cuts some eyes um a lot of apple engineers were using us to file their taxes they follow, thought it was a lot better than doing it themselves and with that um the word gets around right and uh you know you start getting uh, some interests and at the time like i said we we're raising around and uh, you know, people start calling you, whether it's Google Ventures or, you know, uh, Sequoia Capital, uh, Founders Fund. I mean, these are really big names in the industry. These are the people that were first money into Facebook, first money into, you know, Apple, you know, Sequoia's been around for forever. So we flew out there and, um, you know, talking to to the firms, they, they basically said, well, if you if you want to, to take, you know, our money and you want our investment, you have to move out here. Wow. I was like, well, this makes no sense. These are, some, these are like the most innovative companies in the world. And <laughs> like that, I'm, I, I left PwC because I, I was sick right. of like, oh, if you're not sitting in front of the partner, you're you're not earning money for the firm or you're not working, right? It's like, you know, I guess now with COVID, everyone's working remote and we're on Zoom right now. But back then, you know, completely foreign to, to partners. I'm like, wow, th these guys are, are different. Maybe it's not an industry thing. Maybe it's just a you know, demographics thing, uh, you know, generational thing, you know, with, right. with these partners, whether you're a general partner at a fund or, 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 or a general partner at an accounting firm. Uh, but regardless, we said, okay, well, well, you know, life's a lot more expensive in Palo Alto. Miami's fantastic. Okay. Um, let's yeah. see if we could raise some money down here and let's, 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 you know, let's create the company here. If we have to recruit from Europe, which we did and work remote and eventually when we get enough money, get them on an, on an O visa, move the engineers over. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and end up working out, you know, the rent's a lot cheaper here, even today, you know, you're looking around, Oh, everything's skyrocketing. <laughs> it's not, it's <laughs> back then I was looking yeah. at like $1.3 million homes in Palo Alto with no garages, no <laughs> backyards, thousand square feet. Right. <laughs> so, and that was like in 2015, you know, so, uh -huh. You know, price could always go down, sure, but but they definitely can go up. So mm -hmm. so we decided to keep it here, and we, we you know we wrote some money here, uh, and then you know have been here ever since. Well, I'm sure uh, now people are looking back at the decision with everything that's going on today, with so many people and companies migrating to Miami, that that was probably a good decision. Um, you know, I just realized the tax deadline was this past Monday, so this was a really busy time for you guys. Is this, do you see a spike in, in usership and, and transactions happening during this time or is it kind of flat around? Yeah, no, no, there's definitely a spike. Always is, you know, last year the, the deadline was July 15th. There was a spike around July um, before that, April 15th, always a spike. We saw a spike this year, but to be honest, I think people are just so confused over the past uh, two tax seasons with everything going on, PPP, stimulus, unemployment that um, we saw something this year that we've never seen before, which are people just flat out didn't even file an extension. Like they just didn't file uh, <laughs> because there's been so many safety nets, I think that that have been just kind of tossed out there, right? That they're like, okay, well, if I don't file, I'll get a safety net for that because I, I'm, I'm sure as hell not the only one confused, you know, with their tax right. position. So it was pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, when you look at the IRS stats uh, this year compared to last year, they expected 4% more filings. They ended up filing like, half a percent less than in the last year. So that's a net change of almost 5%. Mm -hmm. So that's like millions, you know, like, like 15 million people that just should have filed that didn't file. Wow. Well, that's going to be interesting. We'll see what they do uh, yeah. about that. But um, so now that you're talking about these, um, I, I want to get into a little bit more of the, of the technical pieces. You, you mentioned it's Uber for, accounting practices. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how it works and what are the mechanics of it? Um, well, I'll start with that one first. 
Yeah. So, so the whole spirit of it is, you know, taking the, the firm model and, and disrupting it and putting it on, on its head. So when you work at a firm, you have, but you have to record your budget, your hours. It's like, okay, well, I thought that, that was a, a pretty, you know, old school way of, of conducting a business and suboptimal, you know, everything has a price. We have awesome AI and, and, and algorithms to determine how complex jobs are and there should be a fixed price. So the whole spirit of it was I wanted to create like an Amazon storefront that takes in orders, whether it's for one tax return or 10,000 mm -hmm. from one firm. Right. And then, uh, match them with the with the people on the network that have the skill sets to do it. Right. So it's not like it's offer up or you're bidding. Okay. It's, it's like Uber right. where Uber tells you there's a job or a ride available and you're going to get paid X amount. If you complete it by, by this time here, we do the same. Here's a job. You're going to pay 200 bucks to do this 1040, get it done in three days. You get some uh, additional descriptions on it. So you could determine whether or not, you know, um, you want to take it on. Uh, and then you build a reputation on the platform. So as you build the reputation on the platform, you could take on more and more jobs, right? Uh, we have people that have been with us since year one that now do, like I said, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars in contractor work on the platform. Uh, so essentially they will only work for seven months out of the year and they make a hundred K and then they, they, they could do whatever they want. Like they don't have a boss, right? Um, you know, the onus is on the professional. I, I felt that if you're a CPA, you know, you could do a 1040. <laughs> okay. Uh, you study for the exam, right there, you know, there, there's, there's, and there's a ton of 1040s out there. There's 160 million uh, worth, right. Uh, mm -hmm. That are done every year. Um, you know, and, and if you have some experience, like in doing more complex tax work, like, you know, fund accounting or small business 10, you know, 1120s, 1120s, whatever it may be your state returns, right. Those are skills that you can attach to your profile and that will open you up to those types of jobs, right? And if you're comfortable doing those types of jobs, well, you know, yeah, we have a rating system at the end of the day you do a job, you know, you get rated just like an Uber. So, so you're held accountable. You're in charge of your quality. You're in charge of your time, right? If, if you have poor quality, your, your jobs will decrease, right? Over time, and you know, hopefully not get kicked off, but you, you, get, you could get kicked off. But if your quality stays up and you're responsible and you get the jobs done, you get compensated for it. And you could, you could earn exactly how much you want to earn with, with complete kind of flexible work-life balance without having a, a partner over your shoulder. I mean, I think it's such a brilliant concept because I think, you know, everybody's sort of been in that situation where, you know, you either have the accountant that's been doing your your work for you know the family for years and you know you kind of get grandfathered into that situation or you just have no idea what you're doing or where you're going or what to do and so it's an interesting concept and i, I think it's gonna not just for the accounting world and we talked about this a little bit you know when we had our initial conversation is how does this change staffing in general for any industry um have you thought about expanding outside of this this niche yeah. So um, two parts of that. So, so one thing that we're seeing with firms is that firms are doing, trying to do, get away from the compliance work. Compliance work is considered, you know, write-up work. So it's bookkeeping, tax returns, you know, and the staff work that goes into an audit, right? They're trying to get away from that and do more consulting like M&A, uh, SOC 2 compliance, risk management, things like that, right? Um which obviously has a higher revenue per hour than the compliance work, right? The problem with that is that compliance work doesn't go away. <laughs> you got to follow right. tax return. That same tax return that you had last year is still going to be your client the following year until they die. And then even after they die, you still have to follow their tax return the following year, right? Uh, and you have to do bookkeeping on a small business until the business goes bankrupt, right? So that work stays around for a while. So the, the, the paradox in the industry that we see right now within the firms is that, well, what do you do with all that work? And then how, how does a firm make margin on it and still service that book of business completely, right? Because if you fire them, well, you're just losing revenue and losing potential relationships that could lead to consulting work in the future. So what we do is we come into a firm and we say, okay, well, you could staff this with a W-2, pay payroll tax, benefits, all this stuff, and then you know, have that person work and you'll probably be 
breaking even on the job, maybe making a slight margin, but it's not the optimal use of their time. And you don't really want to train them on that long-term because you want to train them on the stuff that you're making money on the audits, the risk management, the SOC too, right? So why are you wasting all this time, money and overhead when you could just send it to the network and the network is made up of people that just want to do this work. The deal is you're not a partner looking over their shoulders. They're professionals right? They, they got to get it done, you know, to your, you know, they got to file your work papers the way that you like it. You know, we have, you know, tools on the platform that allows you to work within their environment. Okay. Um, but they're their own boss, you know, they're, they're, they're subcontracted out and then they get work-life balance along with, you know, if they continue doing a good job, earning as much as they want to on the platform. Right. And I feel that that's, that mirrors up the cost of the revenue much better than the, the old, the old model. And, and it's a lot better than losing money on compliance work. So we see this, the, the market heading in this wealth management trajectory. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, cons, you know, wealth consulting tra trajectory. And right now there's no solution for the compliance and, you know, and we feel that we're that solution. That's awesome. That is, um, it's just such a different way of, of thinking about it from, from the user perspective or the client, if you will. Um, what is the differentiator there? Are they getting uh, perhaps lower pricing or is it the, the fact that you are literally using an algorithm to match them with the perfect uh, person for the job? Um, how do you market that? Yeah, it, it's everything. So one thing I've learned at PwC or any, any, other firm that worked at is the people that know how to do something well, do it a lot faster than the people that are just thrown onto a job. Mm -hmm. Right. And that could be recurring clients, uh, seeing a client more than once, uh, just specializing into the forms, right. Um, uh, time management, uh, surrounding work paper preparation and things like that. But if you can match someone that just, you know, if you're a pro and you say, I want to just do, um, New York state tax returns, right. On, on our network. Mm -hmm. right. You can make ninety thousand right? dollars, make 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 ninety k, make a hundred k, right? Just just you got to gobble, gobble up all of them, right? But but you're getting out the door faster than someone that was just thrown in and that has to learn on a team and then you know share that document here and then send it for review notes and then get it back, you know, and then review time and it's a mess, right? Here, you're already taking someone's specialty. Right. Granted, you have to build up to that specialty. You could build it up on the platform. You could take the easy jobs and then learn on your own time and invest time into that. So that would then qualify you for other more expensive, better jobs. All right. Uh, but that's one match it up to the people that know how to do it because you're going to do it faster. Right. Two is it's fixed. So, so you're going to make 200 bucks whether you're doing it an hour or, you know, provided an hour before the deadline. Okay. And then you balance your time because obviously, as you know, as you collect documents from the client, you, you know, you could take on multiple jobs at the same time and you could balance your work in between all of them, right? At your own pace. It's not like the firm, you know, if, if you didn't get your client, your work back from, uh, sorry, the documents back from a client and you're booked there the entire week, what are you doing? You're billing admin. Well, I didn't get these documents. And then what you call HR, it's going to take them days, if not weeks to find. And then by that time they staffed you on something else. And then you got the client docs back and now you have to do two jobs at once. It's a mess. Okay. Right. So right. We, we feel that this is more in sync with, you know, how the business should get done. Right. And, and, and by doing that, like I said, you're matching the revenue to the expense. So you, we could optimally price this out where it makes sense for someone on the network to be like, yeah, you know, like I'm seeing great earning potential you know, on the supply side, on the CPA side. And then the firm is like, yeah, I'm seeing great margins here because I don't see any waste, right? In the utilization rate. And I also offload it to an independent contractor workforce that, that, you know, at the end of season or at the end of the contract, they don't have to engage, right? So, you know, they're not paying for the months that they're not sending work, right? And the, and the way that it works on our platform is that you as a pro don't get just access to one firm. You have access to the hundreds of firms that are on our platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all their timelines it, are different. It's amazing. That is fascinating. How many uh, pros do you have currently on your platform? Um, currently it's 3,500 and we're looking wow. to be at 6,000 next year. Wow. That's, 
That is amazing. Well, I, I think it's a fascinating concept. I, I can't get enough of it. I can probably ask a thousand more questions about the business itself, but I want to just take it back to the personal side, you know, for, for a little bit, because, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the broader part of our audience is really students. And one of the things that I've seen over and over again, working at FIU, you know, for a while now is that you know, and thinking back even to when you were a student, you're in the seat, you're in the classroom, you're working toward a degree, you really just want a good job. You don't necessarily sit in the seat. I mean, some of them do, but most of them I would venture to say not is that they're not thinking I'm going to be the CEO or the founder of a tech company. You know, I want to go work for a big four. I want to make a career in this, you know, and so they're not thinking of really all the pathways, you know, in a career or thinking as big, you know, maybe as you did. And I mean, did you did you ever think that this was going to be your path or did it dawn on you after, you know, once you started your career? Yeah, I, I, I always had a little bit of the entrepreneurial spirit in me. You know, in college, I started a, a memory foam company, you know, um, so <laughs> and then there was I had a tutoring company. I wrote an SAT math book um, at one point and um, I, I think that was always in me, but but at the same time, I, I, you know, I wasn't one for, to take stupid risks. So, you know, starting a tech company that was based off of, you know, my eight years of professional experience, you know, in, in public accounting made some sense, right? Going back, if I were to go the non-traditional route, I mean, yeah, obviously I am where I am because, you know, PwC built up that work ethic, that responsibility, the team management, you know, I'm able to build out departments and checklists and control environments, all that good stuff, <laughs> best practices that I've brought from you know, my days of auditing public companies, but, mm -hmm. um, I think I easily could have, you know, taken this degree and got into early days into a project that I felt, uh, uh strong conviction for, right. Maybe back then it would have been Uber, you know, Uber, you know, uh, started in 2009 in 2012, I was really bullish on them. Obviously my platform works similar to Uber and I launched in 2015 well before they went public and um you you know getting you know you could draw inspiration from that you could you could go work there learn parts of a business and then that takes you maybe eventually to become a becoming a data scientist and and it's and, and i know that 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 sounds like okay well i'm investing all this time into accounting all this time into the cpa exam all it does, you know, that doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't correlate one-to-one. -one. It's not like just because you studied all this stuff and took you so long to get the degree that, you know, there's an equivalent output in terms of what your career is going to be moving forward. Um, you know, the, the, the learning curve is pretty steep for, for, for engineering. There's not really any, you know, structured way to learn it. I learned how to code. I, I, I coded parts of the website, <laughs> not anymore. But when we were just a three-person team, you know, to, to a 10-person team, uh, you know, I did some stuff there. I've done some stuff in, you know, SQL. Um, and, you know, over the years, if you're, if you're exposing yourself to that environment, then similar to how when you make the jump or, or how you think about making the jump from tax to advisory or audit to advisory, you can make the mm -hmm. jump from, you know, customer success to, to business analyst, Right. And it comes with stock, you know, and it comes in an environment that's not like, uh, you know, a partnership firm environment that's grinding down to the bones, right? You're working with, and, and, you know, other individuals are usually younger and they're agile and they're talking about crypto, right? And that sounds cliche, but it's, but it's the truth. I mean, <laughs> we yeah, a lot of absolutely. crypto here, you know, we get into projects, mm -hmm. you know, that, that are on the, on the cusp of, of change, you know, we, we, we heard about Ethereum when it was trading at, at 30 cents when it first came out, you know, we, um, yeah. we got involved with, with, with projects. You probably don't know them, you know, but that are now public, like, like, like a Twilio. Um, and that's exciting. You know, now it doesn't have to be tech. I'm, I'm speaking from the tech perspective because that's, you know, that's, that's my environment. That's what I know. Right. And that's the most agile to be, be honest, you know, tech is a lot more agile than even the cruise lines, right. Or the logistics industry. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but, uh, but I'm sure, you know, uh, you know, there's a Tesla, there's a SpaceX, there's a blue horizon, you know, those companies are startups. Yeah. They have some tech, but they're more engineering based. And I'm sure 
there's a similar similarities between what I'm trying to draw here, you know, and, and, and what they have available. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in, in line with that, um, you know, I want to kind of get a glimpse into some of the twists and turns um, from the moment that you, you know, you were in college, graduating college, you, you know, had a career in the traditional accounting world. And, you know, now I'm sitting here talking to you, you've got this amazing company, that's, <laughs> but it, it sounds easy, but I know that it probably wasn't. So from 2015 on, you're launching this company, what were some of the twists and turns that happened there and how did you manage it? Yeah, the, the risk is always pro proportional to re reward, like to be honest, you know, you know, if, if you want to go the safe way, you know, a big four, you're going to get something proportional. So yeah, you put in a lot of work and that's why you can make some good money, but it also comes with years of grinding it out. You know, you have to pay your dues, you know, you're not going to make, there's no chance to make partner in three years, five years, eight years, you know, there's, there's just not yeah. right. Um, so it's proportional, right? Here, it's kind of like, okay, I risk it all. You know, you could be a billion dollar unicorn in, in no time, right? Uh, but then you could lose it all, right? So, um, and that's one thing that, that has been re reinforced for me over the years that the reward is proportional to the risk. And to be honest, I have a different take than, than most people on that. You know, mm -hmm. life is short. Um, that's cliche, obviously, but but it's, it's our reality and I want to spend it in something, you know, that, that, that I believe in. And if, if I could do that and be successful at the same time, well, that's great. And if not, well, okay, fine. I'll call up, a firm. I'll call up a firm and I'll go back to, you know, or, or I'll join tax file, you know, I'll join tax file and do taxes on the side and I'll be happy. Like, like that, that, that's going to be there, you know, and that's there for a lot of people. And that could be there, you know, for me, and that could have been there for me. Right. Yeah. Uh, but my path was a different path. I was I was willing to to forge ahead and 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 put it all on the line, right? Um, so, hey, that's a completely personal choice. There's a lot that goes into that, you know. And you have to, I think, being completely honest with yourself in terms of the amount of risk that you want to take, in terms of what you want to do with your career, you know, um, you know, go for it. You know, I mean, don't be silly about it. Don't you know, have, have realistic expectations, you know, don't be like, okay, I'm going to start engineering at Uber without any engineering experience. No, you know, find a department <laughs> there that, that you can land like customer success, um, you know, partnership management, accounting, whatever, and then make the horizontal jump, you know, at night, start working with the team that you want to eventually be on. Right. And these environments allow you to do that. It's no different than a CPA firm. Right. So yeah. um, there's, there's definitely ways to do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that perspective and that approach to risk taking. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of students, I think, at FIU, just because of the nature of our student body, first generation students, most of them are working full time sometimes while they're going to college. Um, and, and stability is, is important. But I think it's important to hear, you know, from somebody who was in the seat at FIU as a student, um, you know, from, from our town that, you know, this is where you're at today. I'm curious about some obstacles maybe or, uh, along the way as you were starting the company. You know, when you first had the idea and you were approaching others and approaching investors, did anybody say, you're crazy, this isn't going to work? Or what was the, what was the, the general All the time. perception? All the yeah. time. I still, I still, to, to, to today, I mean, I'm always raising money, you know, and, and, I've gotten, you know, over 170 no's. I've pitched everyone from Europe to Singapore, you know, firms and everyone's telling you no. I mean, yeah. heck, even, you know, Elon Musk the other day said that Apple could have bought them at $3 billion. They're worth, what, $590 billion right now. And uh, Tim Cook, you know, a great innovator, Tim Cook, didn't even take the meeting for, with Elon Musk. Not, didn't even hear the pitch, right? So you're going you're gonna to get no, uh, you know, all the time. You know, tough reality. Suck it up, if, if, you know, so... Uh, that's why you have to have the conviction of in your project and, and take your nose and, and move forward. And, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Right. But it didn't work out not because you didn't put your best foot forward, you know? So, um, and more likely than not, if you have the conviction and you could get through those, uh, those troughs, uh, you, you will be successful. Yeah. So 170 no's, that's a lot of no's. <laughs> How did you manage 
you know, how do you keep your motivation? How do you keep your... Uh, Jennifer, they didn't all come at once. I mean, this is over six I'm years, sure. over four, four, four rounds, right? So <laughs> like we've raised, yeah, we've raised, you know, 11 million to date in the door. Um, we have another round going on that's a multiple of that. And when you, when you, when you do a round, you have no idea what position that investing party is in, right? You know, are they actually mm -hmm. looking to invest or do they just want another data point on their spreadsheet to see where the market's going? Right. So you have no idea, you know, they'll tell you it's too early, all this stuff. It's all BS, you know, like, okay, something didn't mm -hmm. match up there, you know? So, and they don't understand your product and your roadmap better than you, you know, right. for as, for as, uh, how about this one good advice, uh, uh, you know, word of advice for everyone here. The logo doesn't really mean much, you know, PwC and putting on your resume and Harvard. I mean, I, dude, I've had so many Harvard, MIT, people that don't work out, people that come from Google, that hire from Google. You know, I also have on the flip side engineers that don't have any formal college degrees and they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they're innovating better than any firm in this industry, any, any of them, right? They have beat out internal teams with tens of millions of dollars of backing on the product side, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the value speaks for itself. Your value speaks for itself and not the logo. The logo's there to catch some eye candy, maybe on a resume, you know, or, or on your LinkedIn, but you know, there's not much substance behind it and in long term. So they could hire you, they could easily fire you. Right. Um, and the same thing goes with investors. You know, if it's a big investment with a big logo, who cares? They say, no, they, they don't understand the platform better than you. They really don't. And, and it's taken me a few years to learn that. Um, so you keep your motivation up because, I mean, I see the growth numbers. <laughs> if you're doubling every year, you're tripling every year in the users. Okay, I'm doing something, right? Okay, fine. You want to invest? Fine. I, I'll make money for someone else. <laughs> That is the best answer ever. And I'm sure some of the folks that you probably spoke to early on are now looking at where you're at and they're like, damn, you know, <laughs> so, that's fine. I mean, look, Hey, you want to invest again? Fine. By all means, come back in. Yeah. High, it's, yeah. It's more, you know, but, but, but that's just, that's how it's going to go. I mean, and, and I encourage you to go out there and read all the no's that Travis clock got. So he got, he's a, the founder of Uber tons of no's. So you know, that's just the nature of the beast. And it's not, oh, once I get successful, I made it. You're, you're never making it. It's just different numbers. You're always pitching. You're going to get passed on. You know, I used to think that, man, once I make, you know, the, once the, the company makes a million dollars, you know, that means product market fit and it's yeah. in Miami and no one's doing this and look how hard it is. And, you know, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's just, it's always, it's always uh, a new hurdle, you know, and, and, and it's no different. So, uh, that's why you have to stand by your convictions. You have to learn that early on in your professional career and, and, and be honest with yourself because if, you know, you could have a product that's going poorly, right. maybe that's why you do get a no. Okay, fine. Then be honest with yourself, right. That this thing is, is heading towards a dead end, but if it's not, then, you know, keep hacking away at that project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh it's an interesting, it's kind of a fine line. I think, you know, when you really believe in something, I think you, you, you see a clear path about, you know, how it's going to go, why, why it's necessary um, in the marketplace, but it, getting other people to see that. And it's interesting how, you know, you determine, oh, well, these people just don't see it. It's a no, no big deal versus mm, this is maybe this is just not a, a viable idea. How do you We're, we're all humans. You're, you know, don't be fooling yourself. The, the, those, my, those thoughts are going to come to your mind you have to process them out and you got to, process them out that you should kind of be like, Oh, I forgot about it. Like, let's not be silly here. You know, this is real life. So, uh, we're emotional beings. Um, you know, the reptilian brain, you know, our emotional side of our, our brain <laughs> determines every single decision we make. It's not the, you know, the, the cerebellum, it's not the logic that makes our decisions, right. It's emotional. So, um, you will have emotional reactions to stuff, but you have to have the conviction that moving forward is, is the right thing. And, 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 you know, and, maybe these decisions are easier, right? Like if you want to find a project and you want to work on, uh, you know, a company that, that you believe in, you know, and you want to get stock in there and, you know, you want to get paid better than you get paid in public accounting and you don't want to be grinding to the bone and you, you know, and you want your work to be more of a joy than, <laughs> than it would yeah. otherwise be. Um, well, you know, you, you could do that easily. 
you know, and you, you know, you, you don't need to, and your, and your highs and lows won't be as, as high as low as, as mine have been over the past six years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure I, it kind of comes with the territory, but I just want to remind the audience really quickly. Um, if you want to ask a question to so use the Q and A feature, I have one or two more for you. Um, but like I said, I can probably be here all day. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be mindful. Uh, mindful of the time and just leave a few questions uh, for the end. Um, but going back to to your student days, was there anything you wish that you had done or paid a little bit more attention to um, sort of as an advice question for our current students? Um, it's going to be weird. I, I wish I would have taken more risks, you know, j j because he, and, and it sounds weird because obviously you could say that I've taken a huge risk. I put all my money into this thing. I've put my family's money into it. I've, you know, uh, you know, my friends, uh, institutional, right. And, uh, but still, uh, I still felt that I left some on the table, you know, like what the hell now, nah, you know, if, if I'm not trying to give it my all here and have, you know, the best time possible, um, you know, I regret not, not taking some more risks earlier on, you know, I don't know exactly how I know definitely yeah. on, on more of the software side, you know, so, which right. yeah, I don't want to bore you guys with that, but definitely on the software side, I would have taken a little bit more risks. Um, and I think I'm, but ironically and paradoxically, I think I'm in a position to say that because as someone that has taken a risk and seen the benefit of it, right. right. I could say that there is success, you know, um, out of it, you know, you're going to, you're not failures, but you will have success. And your success, one success can make up for 10 failures. Exactly. So taking risks earlier or more risks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, you know, working for BDO, I, I can say this because BDO does do, it does our stock too. So, so I pay the money, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, working at, at, at BDO or something like that, you know, me personally, right. If, if you, this is your career path for you, fantastic but my personality type is not that so me personally working for bdo and just saying yeah well you know look at the look at the salary it's consistent it's going to be there they're not going to go under what if we have another recession right making a decision based off those qualifying factors or saying now nah, you know what i know there's volatility in the market but there's this crypto project that i really believe in you know definity or whatever that's one of the projects i love um in california i want to see if you know I could get into there. And if I got an offer and it comes down to Defini or them, mm -hmm. well, even if Defini goes down, what you learn there, right, is so valuable. And, and then you could parlay that into you know, maybe a more stable project you know, or startup or, or tech company. You see what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's what's lost, you know, in the moment that when you're weighing it, you're just seeing it as, oh, this one could go under, this one's backed, and this is steady. And this is easy because I studied it. And the other one is, okay, I studied it. I can apply it. I'll get a job, but I don't know if it's going to be there. Well, what if you actually take that one and you learn things that you didn't know you were going to learn? And that's so much more valuable in terms of different trajectories your career path could take and, and then earning potential, right? On top of stock. So I will say that. I love that. That is, it's so inspiring to hear you say that. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. I want to get to all of them if we can. Um, but the first one is, uh, what would you say has been your biggest challenge in the startup process? Has it been funding, the development, <laughs> the other the factors? I don't know if you can see the questions. I'm yeah, no, I can. I, I just pulled it up. No, I, I laugh because it, it depends on the day. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one day it's funding, the other day it's like product. You know, engineering department was engineering Miami, you have to figure that out. You know, there's, it's not like you're getting coffee with like survey monkey or, you know, Coinbase or I'm making a lot of crypto analogies as today, I guess, because BTC <laughs> had a bad day today, right, but, right. um, you know, you're not in Palo Alto. So, so doing it Miami challenging at one point. Now the engineering department, extremely mature. We have a director of engineering. We have a bunch of different managers of engineering. We have staff, we have sole, project owners, we have data scientists, we have, you know, business analysts, obviously my CTO is my co-founder, right? There's structure there. So, um, but I would say that without that, without a product, you have nothing, you can't fundraise without a product. So one day it's that, 
then it's a fundraising once you get the products, you know, and then, <laughs> and then it's back to square one when, you know, the investors want to see what the next big thing is. So yeah. it depends on the day. You got to be pretty nimble <laughs> to deal with, with all the different yeah. facets of this. Yeah. And, right. and, and that's your, and that's your number one strength in startup world. Your, your strength is your agility. I can move so much faster than PwC. I can move so much faster than uh, uh, H&R Block. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, you have to be agile but it's also your number one strength. Oh man, that's so true. So book recommendations for anybody who wants to enhance the financial literacy, uh, somebody who doesn't maybe have a finance background or accounting background. You're like, I didn't read those books. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I didn't read those books. So for non-accounting person, um, I don't read a lot of accounting books, to be honest with you. <laughs> I thought this was going to be like, like, like financial literacy. If you want to get into the startup world, zero to one, that's like the best one. Peter Thiel wrote that one. Um, to be honest, I don't really find accounting books like that inspiring. Um, you know, uh, so I'll, I have a ton of books in terms of like the things that I read are more, yeah. let's say, um, Right now I have about five open. I can't, I can't, I can't just put one down. I have to have like five going at the same time. And then I also sync them up to my, uh, to my audible. So I could listen to them when I'm in the car, um, <laughs> like personal building. So stability and being in a good place is really important. You know, like, like I said earlier, when you get a no, or when you're dealing with teams, uh, you know, and you're, and you're faced with these, what may seem like insurmountable problems and you get these emotional reactions, right? Stabilizing uh, your emotions makes for the best decision-making, right? So I love like C.S. Lewis. <laughs> He's like yeah. my favorite writer, right? Uh, you know, um, Emmanuel Kant. Um, uh, well, Kierkegaard. Um, you know, and, and things like that. I love reading for just the stability side. And then I have a list like Ben Horowitz, the hard things about the hard things, you know, it, you know, is another great startup book. Zero to one is one that I mentioned. Um, and those books are great. Study, but for me right now, what I find is, is I'm reading a lot of stuff to help provide perspective, you know, to kind of get through those uh, managerial side of, of the day to day. Yeah. I, I love that. I love uh, Caesars is really great. I love them too. Um, biggest difference between TaxFile and other platforms, um, specifically reference TurboTax. So that's interesting. Yeah, well, TurboTax is doing have the platform that is that you can assist, right? That you get assistance on from an account, right? But I mean, tax file TurboTax doesn't take. 10,000 tax returns from, you know, a, a top CPA firm. We do, right? So staffing solution, okay? We're a staffing solution for the 21st century. The way that we pool our, 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 our tax returns isn't just from the individuals that would, you know, um, consider TurboTax, but it's from the firms themselves that are looking to send the work away. So it's a completely bus different business model. It's, it's, you know, we also do bookkeeping, we do tax planning, you know, um, uh, incorporations. So we do a lot more services outside of TurboTax. Yeah, there's an overlap on the 1040 front, but okay. the majority of our business doesn't really align with with what their thesis is. Yeah, it's, um, how does, I mean, it's interesting to think about how, you know, how do they hand you 10,000 documents, you know, so to speak. And I mean, how does that even work on the back end? <laughs> to think about it is just, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, so the way that it works is we have to have to build out. So what, before, so if you download our app and you answer some questions, that's how we, we, we were taking uh, orders for the past five years. And then just in the last year, um, when these firms started to say, okay, I'm not just going to send 500 returns to you. I'm going to send thousands we decided that we need to codify it. So we were working on this OCR, you know, so OCR is a type of technology that allows you to read a document and extract the data that's on it 
and then you store it in your data warehouse and you can use it, whatever. So what we do is when a firm wants to send 10,000 tax returns, we ask them instead of just answering, you know, an order 10,000 times, which is like, honestly, how any other firm will do it. If a firm, if you go to a, a firm down the street, Hey, I need you to do 10,000 times. Like, well, I need to look at every single one, right? It's going to take them months to price them out. We price them out in an instant. And drop your turn. Sorry, I think you you froze at the end there a little bit. Oh, I froze. Yeah, sorry. So, <laughs> what I was explaining. Sorry, there's something probably with the uh, the Wi-Fi here. Um, is is it buggy or am I okay now? No, you're good now. You're good now. I'm good now. Okay, let me shut down my Slack too. Hold on, give me a second. <laughs> So what I was explaining was in the past, you just had to order one by one. You answer some questions describing how each one of those tax returns are done, right? Then when we got to scale, we started leveraging our OCR platform that allows us to read PDFs and automatically create jobs on the platform and price them out. So what a firm does is they now they just drag and drop from their folders and they, you know, into our OCR mm -hmm. folder, and then they instantly get priced out and, 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 and priced, uh, priced out and then and routed to, to the CPAs with the specialties. So we no longer have humans kind of just, you know, interns going through thousands of tax returns, right? And I think that's an industry first, to be honest with you. Yeah, and a huge time saver, right? <laughs> um, so one saver. more, yeah, yeah, one more question for you um, from one of my colleagues. Um, are there opportunities that you see for new or recent grads uh, in our area with all the new startup and finance activity coming down here and uh, any advice that you would give on, on accessing those folks? Um, yeah, I, like I'm hiring uh, intern and level one staff uh, now uh, for CS and for accounting departments. Um, you know, Startup activity down here is weird. You know, for all the press that we get, you know, you see all these big funds. Uh, they're not really investing proportional to what the, all the buzz is yet. Hopefully that changes. Um, we do have a lot of early stage startups, uh, but th those early stage startups aren't really taking on a bunch of interns and a bunch of staff because they don't have, you know, the, the salary capacity to hire them, right? You know, so from a like growth stage perspective, it's, it's slow. Um, you know, but they are out there, you know, like I said, I've never hired based off a, a logo, you know, I've never said, Oh, an FIU person's out because they're up against an MIT or Harvard person. Uh, never, uh, and never will, uh, we, 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 we've been successful hiring here and we have the future leader of, of this company, um, because they, they have a great worth ec ethic and they bought into the vision. Right. And then they've proven themselves that they could be dependable. And to be honest, that's so much more valuable than, you know, a UPenn degree. And I'm knocking on all these degrees and we have people here that have gone to all these schools. It's not a personal so knock on them. Mean. It's not a knock on them. Heck, like for the UPenn as an example, we hired uh, an intern there when he was uh, a sophomore, he was an engineer. And, and then now he has a full-time position and, and he's becoming a leader here in the company. Um, you know, we used to tell them, why don't you just quit UPenn? What do, what do you spend? Like, we're going to hire you anyways. You're going to be doing this. So you fast forward four years, right? He had the position that he would have had if he would have just quit UPenn. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, did you learn anything in your last two years in your computer science classes that you were? He's like, no, I learned more here working on the on the platform than I do at UPenn engineering, oh right? At Penn you Engineering. So to drop out. <laughs> <laughs> Drop out, everyone. <laughs> Come work for tax file. No, but that's a different. That's a different example, though. I mean, because because engineering, the the engineers that I need, it's it's self learning, right? There's there's not really structured courses out there to to that teach you how to to post repos on GitHub and go through JavaScript. You know, it's very theoretical computer science classes, right? And and some more about you know the qualitative stuff that you derive from UPenn than the quantitative direct application in your workforce, right? Accounting is different. You know, you learn how to audit, you learn how to do a tax return. <laughs> it yeah, sets you up for the CPA exam. So two different examples. Yeah. I'm not going to hire someone to work on tax returns that has no tax experience. So please don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't dice up, don't dice up and, and clip this, uh, this comment to make me look bad.
No, no, no. I think it's good that you clarify that because I think there probably would be a handful of students that would be like, well, Ricky said. So, uh, um, so last quit and join tax. I'll learn how to do taxes on tax. No, I'm quitting. I'm kidding. There you go. Recruiting. Well, we can definitely help you with that. We have plenty of students that I'm sure would, would love to be a part of that, uh, of your organization. Um, so anything that I didn't ask you that, that you wanted to get to today or anything else that you want to share, just as final words so we can uh, wrap it up. No, it, it, you know, if you're, if you're curious about getting to the world and, and, you know, you want to do some, you know, customer success, learn how to work with platforms. Um, even if accounting is uh, your, your end point, that's fine. We have, we have positions available. So please reach out. We have a career page on, on taxfall.com. They could go to, you could apply and, and hopefully uh, we could work something out. Oh, amazing. Ricky, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We're really looking forward to sharing this with the rest of the FIU student body and uh, we'll send you a copy of it as well. Um, but so proud that you're an alum of FIU. I know you're an alum of UM as well, but that that's fine. We'll forgive you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, no, we're, we're, we're just really proud that uh, you've accomplished so much and that you're taking the time to come back and, and pay it forward and share with our students. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me, however, however I could help. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. Thank you. Bye.